Okay, here we are. Uh, let me introduce you to Ana Segurado. Ana Segurado is the, is the uh, Telefónica's uh, Corporate Venture uh, Capital Fund Manager. And Fernando Bueno, who is the, the Chief of Innovation at Mutua Madrileña, an insurance company. And uh, Dayan Finkhausen, uh, Head of Open Innovation at uh, General Electric. Dayan, is it your first time in a bullfight ring? Yes, yes, not my last. <laughs> not, not your last, okay. But today the, the ring is, uh, is not for fighting, it is a space um, to, share, uh, uh, to share ideas, to spend time with uh, entrepreneurs and innovators and to talk about something we all love, which is entrepreneurship, innovation, and how big corporations can leverage on the uh, startup ecosystem to take the most of it and, and to foster innovation within the companies. For the most, uh, innovation inside an uh, existing company is something that only happens after a huge effort. And, and it is seen as something which is not repeatable, as something uh, which cannot be done by design. Yeah? I, I would like to ask you about, about this and, and, and if uh, we can somehow make it happen by design and what stops the corporation from being more innovative? That's Who a likes great, to take it? It's a great question. Um, I, I think that um, innovation is, is by definition, it's new, right? So it is um, the definition of, or the creation of novel approaches, novel processes, um, the application of new technologies, new materials, um, new thought processes, but, but we believe very strongly and we live by the fact that innovation can be a process by design. And we've spent a lot of time thinking what approaches, what, um, what innovation processes can help keep us young, right, and, and um, encourage fresh thinking and risk taking, but yet um, introduce changes to our business that are scalable, that are repeatable. And so we, we have developed a, a framework that, that encourages risk taking and experimentation. We spend a lot of time working with startups and entrepreneurs to, um, to look at the world through a different lens and to um, really challenge ourselves to think differently about how we solve problems. Um, so we, we have a framework, it works very well, it's repeatable, and we have applied that framework um, to introduce innovation to a very diverse range of businesses. We work with um, our aviation business, our healthcare business, our energy business, and, uh, and all of the industries that GE serves to look at those markets and those worlds through very different lenses, partnering with customers, partnering with entrepreneurs, and um, other thought leaders, policy makers, to, um, to try to reimagine outcomes for those industries. Uh, many of the markets that we serve are, are challenged, and um, everyone's trying to do more with less these days. It's, um, the world is full of opportunities, but also full of resource constraints. So we are, we're working um, very closely with startups who can um, teach GE how to be more agile and be more comfortable taking risks and um, to look at our customer, customers' challenges from their point of view. And then we um, are able to apply the domain expertise that we have in-house and um, come up with new solutions, right? Innovative, disruptive solutions to create new pools of opportunity for our customers and our businesses in these markets. It's very exciting, but it is a process that, that we apply to very diverse markets. So. Anna? Okay. I, I, I think that for big, big corporation as Telefonica or GE or even Mutua is, uh, it's difficult to generate internal innovation uh, as uh, bureaucracy and uh, processes, internal processes sometimes uh, kill innovation. 
Uh, so open innovation is becoming critical for all of big corporations to really identify and uh, get innovation inside our organizations. Um, another problem I identify in big corporations is that uh, from the human resources uh, areas, uh, we don't have the correct processes and the, um, the correct ways to, to identify innovation talent and identify the most creativity uh, people among employees. And uh, once, I mean, on one side, we can, it's not easy to identify the, the most talented people for, for this uh, create, uh, innovation activity. And on the other side, there are not the correct procedures to uh, reward innovation um, among big uh, corporations. Uh, so that's why open innovation uh, as a way of uh, get innovation from outside our corporation and bring it uh, inside our corporation to, to be more uh, innovative is becoming critical for us. What about you, Fernando? Well, uh, you have uh, said a lot of things about that, but for me there are two important barriers. The first one for companies, big companies, is the success. These companies have had a, a successful strategy whose has uh, got the, to be grow to grow a lot, and uh, the executives are focusing on short-term actions, not long-term ambitions, uh, opt optimizing the business, not trying to disrupt the business. I think this is one of the main barriers. The, the executives ask, why, why do we need that? Why do we need uh, to innovate, to incorporate other actors in the innovation? Uh, area, for example, for outside the company and so on. We know how to, how to do things. We are profitable, make money. Uh, we don't need that. I think this is one of the main barriers for me. And the second barrier is uh, fear of cannibalization. Right? I name it the Kodak effect. It's, uh, the people uh, is very fearful about how the disruptive products or new offerings is going to, adapt, to affect to the current business. Yeah? And they don't like these kind of things. They always say, hey, what happens with our main flow of money? So for, uh, for me, these are two things uh, very important you must uh, overcome in order to make working uh, open innovation in a company. So, so it seems that, that Big companies focus so much on, on being efficient and they establish policies and procedures and, and KPIs and, and all of those things uh, obviously help them to do things every day better. Uh, but they're working on a problem business model. But, but when it comes to do something different, somehow those same tools that are used to be more efficient can also uh, become an impediment for continuous innovation. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Leanne? Yes, they're focusing on, on optimizing. It's what K KPAs do for you, but not in doing something completely new. And, and what, what can we do uh, about that? And can, how, can we, how can we change that? Can we redesign big well, corporations? Uh, it's complex to redesign big corporations. No? Can you go to the, to the financial team and tell the, hey, <laughs> look at this. I mean, you should you should look at the long run. <laughs> yes. Well, I can go to every chief and say whatever I want. The problem is that they pay attention to me, no? <laughs> but they, uh, you must understand, they are very focused in the term, in the quarter, and most of these things are not related to the quarter, to the next quarter, no? So the KPAs, the financial results, uh, the sales are more related to what I'm going to do tomorrow, and this is the day after tomorrow. That is a problem. How can we change that? I think, like every culture, cultural change, you must begin small, try, learn, uh, with the learning, correct your errors, and it's getting bigger, increasing the scope of the program in order to get the organization follow you. And in the, in the midterm, it's not easy anyway. We don't have uh, uh, nominally. Uh, we don't have this problem because we <coughs> have the top, uh, the support of the top management, including the chairman. But 
the day-to-day -day business eh, is an obstacle to all that. All that. So you must fight act as a psychologist sometimes in the organization. Eh, you must do a lot of things. It's like a catalyst. You know? You're being for industrial. We have an industrial company. Well, I think uh, there is something which is obvious. Uh, is that uh, startups uh, innovate better and faster than big corporations. So I think no one has doubt about that. Uh, why is this happening? Uh, I think uh, on one hand we have what I mentioned before, the bureaucracy and the processes of big corporations are not prepared to foster innovation. Uh, but there is a, another um, factor which is difficult to change. Um, startups needs, uh, need to innovate to keep alive and uh, I mean it's, it's critical to offer the best for not dying. I mean they need to, to gain clients, they need to grow, they need to compete, uh, otherwise they will die. Uh, so that uh, this pressure is what I think makes a startup innovate so fast and such in a clever way. Um, big corporations uh, don't have this pressure, so although we have uh, talented people for, for innovate, uh, I think uh, the pressure they have is different and sometimes that uh, makes a big corporation innovate a lower and a worse than startups. Well, that, that, that's a very interesting point. Diane, do you, do you think that uh, innovation inside an existing company is harder than in a startup? That's a great question. I, I think innovation is, um, it, it presents unique challenges for startups and large corporations. I, I think some of the, the challenges may be different in, in each organization. It's easy for larger organizations to focus more on those mature, um, kind of high volume, um, high, high volume production KPIs, right? And focus on different success metrics. Um, but, but then too, I think that allows, <coughs> allows big companies to get a little bit more comfortable Right, and, and maybe stop challenging themselves to continue to grow and innovate. So we, um, we focus very much in our organization. We're a big company, many small companies within a big company, and we're challenging ourselves to, again, learn from our startup uh, peers and take more risks, run more experiments. And for those experiments, we are um, in many cases, we're setting them up in, um, in different kind of operating business models where they focus more on learning metrics rather than the large-scale mature business KPIs. And, uh, and so that is allowing us to behave more like entrepreneurs in many of the more innovative initiatives in our organization. Um, so we're, we're learning, we're taking a lot of um, best practices from the startup community, um, applying learning metrics and growth metrics to our innovation initiatives, and then allowing our mature business lines to continue to operate against those kind of uh, very mature KPI uh, success metrics. Um, and so I think if that's, that's our innovation definition of success in operating culture for a large organization. Of course, um, I, I, I would defer to our, our colleagues here in the audience to maybe um, share their perspective regarding what success looks like and what KPIs make the most sense in startups. But I, I think startups are, are more willing to kind of pivot, right? Learn more quickly and pivot and establish um, new direction or new success metrics as they learn and and so much more agile um, as you scale up your your vision right so that 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 new product that new business venture that that you've developed I think you're you're closer to your market and you are you're taking your cues from how the market is responding to you're offering and you're, you're pivoting and refining a lot more quickly probably than a larger organization might. So we're, we're trying to uh, take a lot of best practices from, from watching you and learning with you. 
So this, despite the huge amount of resources that, that big companies dedicate to innovation, since that, that you three agree that it is much easier to innovate from a poor startup without resources at all. No? Is, that, is that right? No. Yeah. Could, be, could be an interesting conclusion. I'm going to open, um, I'm inviting you to, to ask um, any questions you like. You have uh, three people uh, with a uh, huge experience in corporate innovation and who are dealing every day with the startup ecosystem. So uh, I will go to the next question, but think about your question, and you're invited to, to ask. Um, so what can we learn from startups? What can we learn? What can we learn uh, to foster innovation in big companies? Well, we can learn a lot of things, no? We can learn uh, the teamwork, the real teamwork, eh, to achieve a common objective, not my functional objective or my business, my business unit objective. We can learn from the mindset, the uh, disruptive mindset. Eh? It's very difficult to change that in big corporations. Uh, the agility of the team, of the small of the startups, the bu bureaucracy in the big corporations uh, uh, makes you spend a lot of time launching the new offering on even identifying new opportunities. It's very complex. Uh, perhaps uh, we have uh, anyway the corporation have uh, another advantage is uh, who are resources, knowledge, access to markets, some little things eh, important for innovation. But I think the, the, the more important thing is the agility. And the big corporation, as bigger, is less difficult to uh, develop a, a continuous flow of innovations and put them in the market because uh, they don't fit in the system portfolio, because existing executives doesn't like it, or just bureaucracy, approvals, and, and so on. Anna, what about Telefonica? Well, what did I, I you learn think... from startups? Let me tell you that Telefonica is one of the Spanish companies which has dedicated more resources um, to scout and to be very close to startups. They have Waira, which is an incubator now established in its 13 countries. 13 mm -hmm. countries. I was in the opening of the first one in Bogota and, and, and then many others. Uh, you have been dealing and supporting with something like 200, 300 startups through Waira, um, but you do many other things uh, to get closer to startups. But uh, what have you learned from yeah. that? Uh... No, I mean, uh, Telefonica is uh, in the technological sector. Uh, for us, it's critical to bring innovation from outside because uh, things uh, change every day. So we cannot innovate uh, as the speed the market is asking us for. Uh, so we have to complement our internal R&D uh, processes and innovation with innovation coming from outside. So we are very aware of that. And we have developed, as you mentioned, um, a different instrument to, uh, to bring uh, startups and to, to work with startups in order to uh, push innovation and do things together. So in that way, we have uh, the WIRA uh, initiative, which is a network of accelerators uh, looking for seed uh, startups and uh, seed opportunities. Then we have the network of BC funds, which is Amerigo, uh, and the Corporate Venture Fund, which are both focused in growth opportunities uh, with different sector uh, focus, but uh, both in growth opportunities. Uh, and what can I see in uh, startups and what uh, we have to learn from them? Uh, well, I think they have uh, very talented uh, people, uh, very committed with their own projects, uh, and very focused on results. Uh, so these are three characteristics which uh, uh, makes that, uh, I mean, makes uh, innovation easier. So apart from that, I think they, they look for opportunities with a very open mind uh, and uh, they do things out of the box. You sometimes uh, have to break the rules and, and look at an approach 
uh, to the problems with an open mind. And sometimes in, in big corporations are so focused in our own business that it's difficult to have this view to see opportunities doing things different. Breaking the rules sounds good. Um, Diane, what can you learn? What can we learn um, from big corporations when it comes to innovation from startups? Yeah, I, I would share some of the same perspectives that we've just heard. I, I think that, um, that we take a lot of inspiration from startups in the, um, the willingness and the comfort level to look at the world through a very different lens, to experiment, try different things, and learn as you go, and then refine your approach very quickly. Um, and I think that that gives you the, the ability to um, kind of uh, align yourself very quickly, very effectively, very um, easily with your target markets and with your target customers. You have that incredible focus and that agility. Um, and, and we're learning from that and we're taking that back into our own business approach as well. And then as, as we conversely, as we work with startups, um, we work extensively with startups and entrepreneurs. Um, it's a very, very healthy um, kind of a good experience for both of us. As they, as they grow their businesses, we're able to share conversely our experience with them um, regarding how to kind of begin to scale those, those visions and those startup organizations into larger organizations so we can share our experience with you know, more process rigor and how you develop a, a scaled organization. So it's, it's a very good um, relationship <coughs> that we share with the startups with whom we partner. Um, we're, we're constantly kind of challenging each other, learning from each other, but, um, but it's a, a very, um, very beneficial, healthy relationship with, with the many entrepreneurs with whom we partner. So hopefully, uh, hopefully <laughs> we'll continue to learn and, and grow with them. Okay. Do we have any questions from the audience? Not for now. Okay, so, so despite the huge resources that corporate... Okay, go ahead. All right, thank you. I'm Shaheen from spotahome.com. We're a startup, and it's the easiest way for expats to book rental housing in a new city when they're moving abroad. My question is, um, how do you guys choose which startups you work with? And what value do you bring to them? And also, what are some examples of success stories that you've had so far? Thanks. Okay. Who likes to go first? It has you first. Oh, OK. Um, so it's a great question. And, uh, and we, we work with many. Um, typically, we will um, choose to work with startups who have visions and products and, and uh, plans that are well aligned with the businesses, the, the various business teams. So as an example, our healthcare team will work with partners who may bring new technologies or new approaches um, that, that are um, very well aligned with our vision for where we'd like to go in those markets. Same thing with our aviation industry. Um, we, we are um, spending more and more of our time really across the businesses, but with aviation as an example, looking at how we might be able to apply the industrial internet to improve our customers' outcomes. So as an example, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can apply um, data-based software and software-enabled services to help the airlines and, and ultimately the passengers in the aviation industry. Um, so whereas our, our tradition has largely been in aviation equipment developing and, uh, and supporting aviation equipment, we're now building out software-enabled software services in the aviation industry, so we're looking for a lot of partnerships that bring those areas of expertise to the aviation business. And the same holds true with, with our energy business, with our um, healthcare business, our power business, um, where we find startups that, that have complementary visions or, or capabilities, we, we look for partnerships there. Uh, in our case, what we try to do is to complete uh, the solutions we offer to our clients, both corporate clients or residential clients, 
with the products or services that uh, different startups uh, has uh, brought to the market uh, and include them in our offer and integrate with our solutions to, 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 um, to give uh, better products to our clients. But I, I must say that this is not uh, easy. Uh, in the, I mean, in the activity of um, um, bringing uh, out, outside innovation in in big corporation, you have uh, two challenges to face. The first one is to identify the best companies and being capable of attracting it uh, to your organization. So close a transaction with them, close a commercial agreement, uh, close a corporate deal in which you enter in your in, in their equity. Uh, so selecting the best one, the one that matches uh, the best with your business is not easy, but it's possible. But uh, making them grow independently and, uh, I mean, scale up those companies and at the same time extract all the value that, that this company can offer to you and give them uh, also um, um, the proper help is, is almost magic. I think there's not a, a formula to, to do that. And we are exploring different ways of uh, approaching startups and making things together, uh, both on the commercial side, both on the R&D development. Uh, but uh, I mean, I must say that this is difficult and uh, I think none of us has the formula to, to the success. Fernando, do you, do you, well, how, uh, La Mutua tries to leverage on the startup ecosystem to, to find... Well, we, we are trying. <laughs> we are trying. Well, it's a way. Uh, we, are, we began with Open Innovation in, in, 20, uh, in 2010. Uh, we began with a program of Open Innovation with employees. Then we passed it to customers, added the customers, and then we began to work with providers and startups. This is the last move we have made in the last year. Uh, so we are at the very beginning of that. Uh, we, uh, what we, we look for in the startups, uh, things we can provide by ourselves uh, quickly. For example, uh, com uh, complete our value proposition to customers, link it to lifestyles, for example. We are an insurance company working for individuals, so uh, things, uh, value-added services to families, uh, value-added services to motorcycle or car drivers, uh, things like that. Uh, we look for new ways of distribution, uh, of insurance distribution, of serving our customers. Uh, and we look for uh, methods and technologies to enhance our process, our business processes to do the same thing, but the, the different form. And finally, uh, because we are a mutual company, uh, we look for projects uh, linked to uh, social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. So these are the main ways uh, we are trying to collaborate with startups. So Diane, Ana, and Fernando, here you have uh, many entrepreneurs. So it is mm -hmm. your chance to challenge them mm -hmm. by telling them what kind of startups and innovators are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, if Fernando, I, I would defer to you and build on it. Maybe you can spend some time in Madrid giving a lecture and making a deal. Who knows? <laughs> I'd love that. Absolutely. Well, let me um, maybe share some examples, and, uh, and maybe this will, will spur some conversation. Um, but uh, what, um, what we love to do is, um, is partner very closely with startups to create new, new types of outcomes and improved outcomes for our customers, right? Or, or create new markets, right? That, and new value pools and, and new markets that may not have existed. And I'll, I'll share a very specific example where, where we've seen this model work really, really well. And um, this, may, this may be familiar to some of you, but uh, we have, within the past year, established a part Mike, oh, there we go, with um, a couple of uh, startups in our appliances division. So if, uh, if everyone is familiar with GE Appliances, 
We, um, we have a very, very long tradition of providing consumer appliances and um, a, a very, um, very mature manufacturing process. And so um, in our conversations with startups, um, <coughs> we, we have um, challenged ourselves and they've challenged us to be more nimble and to um, have a, a much closer dialogue with our customers and, and try to um, reinvent the way we make appliances and, and launch new appliance products. And so we have, in the past year, established a partnership called Local Motors. I apologize, I'm losing my mic. But um, a, a company called Local Motors, it's a small organization in, uh, based in Phoenix in the States, and they are a, a crowd-sourced company and also provide small batch manufacturing and rapid prototyping. Um, we have also partnered with the University of Louisville, so it's a three-party relationship um, with a startup and a university, and the goal of this partnership is to introduce new appliances not in three years, but in six months, which for GE in, in this line of business it was kind of an extraordinary goal. And so we just established a, um, a micro factory in Louisville on the campus of, of the University of Louisville um, whereby we are crowdsourcing designs, new ideas for new appliances, and we're um, running those ideas through this small batch, this new small batch manufacturing rapid prototyping facility, and in fact introducing new products in, a, in, in months, not years. And so it, it's those types of paradigm shifts that, that we're looking for in our mature industrial businesses. How can we challenge ourselves to bring all the strengths of the entrepreneurs and the startups, the agility, the, the risk taking, the fresh thinking, the proximity to, um, to kind of new perspectives and reinvent the way we do business so we can encourage growth, we can create new value pools, and we can transform our markets and, and our customer outcomes. So it's those kind of partnerships that we're really looking for across the board. Anna? Uh, well, for Telefonica, uh, in terms of uh, industry focus, uh, the technology sector is, is, is uh, very wide and we are looking for opportunities in many different sectors. I mean, in most of the digital areas, we are uh, looking for uh, startups. But in terms of uh, the startup situation, uh, as I mentioned be before, we, uh, we make investment and we make agreements, uh, we close agreements with uh, startups in a uh, early stage, uh, in a, yes, in a early stage or in a seed uh, stage. We also make agreement, uh, I mean, close agreements with uh, growth uh, startups which are in a growth stage. And uh, we have um, Examples of uh, business-to-consumer startups, business-to-business -business startups, which, which has entered in our uh, initiatives. I think, uh, I mean, um, the goal here is to make the startup uh, growth at the same time as we generate growth to, to be close to this startup. And for me, the easiest, uh, I mean, um, the startups in which this is more uh, easy to, to get is uh, when we identify a business-to-business -business startup which is in a growth stage. Uh, so, I mean, it has a product or a service uh, in the market. Uh, they are not in the stage of developing the product, but they already have the product, but they have difficulties to reach to corporate clients. It's, it's very difficult for a startup, at least in Spain, uh, I mean, uh, to close transactions and to close agreements with big corporations. I mean, there's a, a question of uh, reputation and size which make it uh, very difficult. So I think Telefonica in these cases is a great partner as we can offer them a lot of uh, commercial opportunities. We can go together to be clients. 
So we benefit from a very innovative uh, product uh, which completes our solution and our offer to the clients and they can uh, grow because they, uh, they can reach to be clients and uh, has a commercial opportunity. So I think this is the kind of situation in which it's very easy to, uh, to have advantages for both uh, the startup and also Telefonica. So you're telling me that once you invest in a startup, you call the business people and, and you tell them, follow me, let us help me, help me to grow this startup, and they follow you? Well, I think the process is, uh, is a bit different. We identify uh, in which areas we are most interested in, in identifying uh, products or solutions to complete our own developments. Uh, then, I mean, uh, we search in the, in, the, in the market which startups fit better with our strategy and with our uh, developments. And, uh, yes, we usually try to, um, um, to get a stake in the equity of those companies because it's a way of having a narrow relation with the company and uh, having a very, um, very close uh, relation with them. And uh, at the same time, we work on the commercial um, uh, development, uh, working with the people of the operating business, identifying commercial opportunities, and trying to bring this product to, to our uh, offer. So this is the process. Any more questions? Toby Lewis, Global Corporate Venturing, uh, a media provider which tracks how corporates invest in venture. Um, I was wondering sort of what success sort of looked like for your various sort of open innovation divisions. Can you sort of share any examples of the sort of kind of scale of business that you're able to create with these partnerships and if there is sort of any concrete examples of that? Examples of success? Yeah. Uh, well, in, in my case, for instance, uh, we are doing very interesting things with some uh, startups in the security or cyber security sector. We have, for instance, a, a, a deal with a startup which name is Bluelib. Uh, we took a stake in, in that startup um, um, I mean, uh, using our Amerigo fan, which is uh, managed by Kibo. So Kibo took a stake in the equity. Also, uh, our venture, corporate venture fund uh, took a stake in, in this startup. And uh, we are now uh, offering uh, the product of the startup uh, to our clients with a lot of success. We are generating uh, internal sales for Telefonica, and they are growing at a high speed. Uh, and uh, having access to clients that uh, probably, if they, if they were alone, they, they couldn't uh, reach. Uh, so this, this is an example. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. It's a great example. And I, we have many um, really exciting stories to share as well um, in our partnerships with startups. I, I think the most recent uh, success we've had with a startup partnership is the local motors and uni university of louisville um we like i said we set up the micro micro factory on the university campus in march and i was there two and a half weeks ago and i saw new appliances new first build appliances on the floor on my tour so it, the the speed to market that commercial intensity is extraordinary and so that's, you know, we're, we're looking for that commercial intensity and that innovation as that is our definition of success in these partnerships in many cases. Um, we also, again, you, you may have heard of this partnership as well, but we are partnering with another company called Quirky, um, which is uh, a really wonderful startup, again, in, in the crowdsourcing arena and um, love this partnership, love this business model. They, they have been um, looking at our portfolio of consumer products and, um, and frankly, IP with us and pushing the, um, the products and the IP out to their 
proud their community and asking, encouraging <coughs> their community to help us innovate and test and validate and refine new products. And so we were um, working very closely with them on our new line of LED lighting, which is um, really a, a global phenomenon. The, the lighting industry is going through a new renaissance and um, we're really enjoying the, the results of this partnership with Quirky to explore how we can introduce, develop and introduce new intelligent lighting systems for the consumer arena. And, um, and the most recent line of, of lighting that, that has um, run through this partnership has, um, has already sold out. It, it, it's, they've been pre-marketing uh, it through Quirky and it will, it will retail through some of our big box retail partners and, and it's already sold off, off the shelves. So again, it's that commercial intensity and that innovation and that ability to kind of refine on the fly the, the product innovation, and it's, it's been so successful. We, uh, we'd love to take that blueprint to more and more of our businesses to spur growth. Um, we're, take these, uh, these industries where we have sold big equipment, big iron um, types of products, and, and really redefine what growth looks like in mature markets with mature industries. So, so um, Anna, ma many of them are looking for, um, for funds for these startups. Why should they try to get in touch with you, a corporate fund, instead of going somewhere else? What, what are the pros and cons? Well, I think a big corporation as, as investors in startups uh, offer advantages and also disadvantages to, to entrepreneurs. Uh, I think on the, on the positive uh, side, um, I think we, we offer a lot of business support, commercial opportunities, uh, knowledge of the industry, uh, which can be very useful for, for them. And also we can share technology and uh, uh, make uh, developments uh, together. Um, another positive uh, advantage is that um, sometimes we are prepared to pay for, for the potential synergies we identify in those startups. So perhaps we are not so uh, hard negotiating the price that uh, a financial, a traditional financial VC. Um, but, I mean, uh, we also have disadvantages. Um, probably the processes uh, to close a transaction with a big corporation is uh, slower than uh, with a traditional VC, uh, because our internal processes for approval are uh, more complex and uh, more slowly. Uh, the follow-up of the company in terms of uh, following the performance and the financial KPIs and the business plan is, is not so narrow uh, in our case because um, we are more focused on uh, the business, uh, we are more focused on the development of the product and the commercial uh, aspect and not uh, in the financial KPIs. So I think the pressure of a, a, a traditional VC for a startup is, is good uh, to be able to offer the best and do the best with, uh, with the money they, they manage. Um, and uh, so we uh, traditionally stay for longer in the equity of the startups. We are not in a hurry for divesting if we find a good opportunity. If there is a good strategic fit, we remain in the equity of the company for a longer period. Um, and sometimes we can also offer the, the opportunity to bring another interesting investors to the, to the equity of those startups. Diane, it seems to me amazing that you're currently running something like 50 process of yeah. open innovation, challenging entrepreneurs and innovators all around the world. But, uh, but I wonder, how, how do you balance the conventional, let's say, um, open <coughs> innovation function with, with this effort of, of being almost everywhere, getting ideas from everywhere? Great question, great question. It's, um, we have a, a long tradition of um, in GE generations of 
very, um, very high quality closed innovation that leads to very high quality, um, high volume production. And, uh, and so the, the answer is balance, right? So we are applying open innovation and partnering with, um, with the external innovators and entrepreneurs, and we're bringing that, that fresh perspective and innovation into our development process, our innovation process, to, to complement what we do internally. We define open innovation as both internal and external innovation. We, um, we are a diversified organization, so um, a, a, a power generation engineering team may look to collaborate with engineering teams and other divisions to bring that fresh perspective into the power generation innovation process. And so um, we, we define open innovation as both internal and external collaboration opportunities. <coughs> um, we, we are expanding our use of the open innovation tools and, and projects, um, 50 and growing, hopefully. Um, but, um, but the key is to make sure that that we maintain our, um, our trajectory and, and our priorities, our business priorities that we've committed to, but then we begin to accelerate those and expand those priorities by partnering with, with innovators outside of the GE community. Um, so it's really, it's intended to accelerate and expand our business priorities and the outcomes that we can deliver for, for our, our customers but the key is, is balancing, right? Do no harm, expand, and accelerate. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Hi. Um, the question is for, for Diane. Um, how do you see the Internet of Things evolving within the industrial side of GE? Great question. So um, the Internet of Things is such an exciting space right now. We have committed completely to the Internet of Things and, um, and have established a, a business unit in, uh, in San Ramon to um, really help us layer internet, industrial Internet solutions across all of our industrial businesses. And I, I think that to answer your question very specifically, the Internet of Things will, will transform the way business gets done in a multitude of industries, ranging from healthcare to aviation. It's just, um, it is enabling um, intelligent decisioning, um, basically software and software-enabled um, services to create these decision support tools that will help operators and, and corporate executives alike really optimize, re-optimize complete systems, whether those are manufacturing um, systems or aviation systems or healthcare systems creating a, a frictionless patient experience. There are so many ways to collect and use data to create insights and to create decision support systems that will help people and, and businesses completely rethink the way that they deliver business services. So it's, it's really exciting. Thank you. Um, we have to go, but before that, I, I would ask you to give a, a 30 seconds conclusion, your own conclusion on uh, startups, big corporations, and innovation. Starting with Anna, for example. <laughs> no, I think the, the, the main message I would like to, to, to express is that uh, Corporations uh, need startups. Uh, they are critical for our uh, for our growth, and um, I think the the joint uh, and the uh, the alliance with the startup can, can bring a lot of value for uh, for both the startup and and the big corporation. Fernando, well, I think uh, startups. Uh, shouldn't think in, uh, about corporations only as a provider of funds, but as a partner to do business together. I think it's another way of growing and to getting cash. And I think uh, corporations should think in the same way, not only I invest or not invest in that uh, business, but 
is this business attractive to work with me, with my existing business, or with my new business I want to, to attack? Uh, I think uh, something we should change uh, our way of thinking, <coughs> not only as an investment, but as how it fit with our strategy. Maestro, otro paso doble. Para Dayan. ¿eh? <risa> y un fuerte aplauso, por favor. <risa>